This video will contain spoilers for Xenoblade Chronicles 1 only. Wow, that's only one video game. Usually these videos contain spoilers for many more video games than that. Now, you may have heard me complain in the past about how Shulk gets a lot of things handed to him and gets bailed out of a lot of certain death situations throughout Xenoblade 1. I don't think I've ever actually used the phrase plot armor for this though, largely because he has Monado armor, that's a very different thing. While I do have my opinions on certain things that happen to Shulk throughout the story, and especially how the community likes to compare them to similar things in Xenoblade 2, some of this really is to be expected. Shulk is ultimately a shounen protagonist. That's the kind of fictional character that arguably has the most plot armor per capita, so while you can criticize it from a writing standpoint, you can't really be too mad that any of it actually happens in the first place because I think it would probably be a very boring story if Shulk had too little plot armor rather than too much and died, like, before even getting to Prison Island. So yeah, Shulk, and by extension the rest of his party members, having the most plot armor out of everybody in the game isn't necessarily a bad thing and is probably necessary to tell the story the developers were trying to. Unfortunately, the character with the most plot armor in the game is not Shulk or a party member, and it is an example of objectively terrible writing. Even more sadly, the culprit is a fan favorite, as we need to point our fingers at the esteemed Colonel Vanguard. He is the Van Man of this game, something that shows up in every single different Xeno universe, and is arguably the only one to demonstrate a significant amount of plot armor, so perhaps in addition to being terribly written, he actually stole the plot armor from all of his counterparts across space-time, which is an even more heinous crime that means he should be even further called out in this video than he already will be. Now, Vanguard is a Homs, and barring some ether sensitivity, Homs are more or less the same thing as humans. However, Xenoblade is, for all intents and purposes, a shonen anime, and in that genre, being human does not necessarily mean you would not be superhuman in the real world. While humans in Shonen can be as weak as normal humans, even without engaging in the main power system of a universe, they can be massively stronger, faster, and more durable than a human would be in real life. Ryan, Dunban, and Sharla all demonstrate this to different extents throughout Xenoblade 1, but while his training regimens were responsible for making Ryan how he was at the beginning of the game, and do seem like they would require some level of superhuman ability to pass, we never see any hints that Vanguard himself possesses anything like that. And yet, he survives everything. Vanguard's weapon of choice is a heavy-duty ether gun, the kind of weapon that should be able to at least somewhat harm mech on armor without access to topple or the Monado powers, and yet, he tries to shoot Metal Face with it, gets blown back several feet just from the recoil of his own weapon, and it doesn't do anything, of course, because it's Metal Face. That much should be expected. He's then pinned down by a Mechon M72, a generic Mechon enemy, the likes of which Ryan and Dunban are both shown to be capable of pushing back before growing a whole lot throughout the rest of the story, and while he's down, Metal Face throws a transport at him, it seems to land directly on top of him, and then explodes, and he survives this. I will say him showing up later in the game is not a plot hole or bad writing or anything. If you talk to all the NPCs in Colony 9 after the attack, you will find one that says he survived and his wounds are being treated. But if you compare that explosion, there's no real way it was less damaging of an attack than the thing that we know as a fact explicitly killed Fiora. And by the way, Fiora was strong enough where Vanguard was actively scouting her for the defense force and tried to ask her to join at least once, so she shouldn't even be that far behind Rhine in terms of power, possibly even into the realm of superhuman herself, and that killed her, but literally getting blown up didn't kill Vanguard. Very, very interesting. He's next seen in the second battle of Sword Valley, once again leading the Colony 9 defense force, this time with better gear supplied by the High Entia. In the battle at Colony 9, he was shown to not like the fact his men were retreating, but he ultimately did still care about their safety. Yet here, he's shown as basically just being completely reckless, with no strategy other than charge and hope for the best, which in this case, they're basically charging down a massive hallway and have a limited amount of air support, so 
this doesn't really seem like the kind of strat that would be conducive to surviving. And yet, survive he does, till the next time we see him. This is after the first time the party confronts Egil and the Bacchanis starts moving. He, like many other soldiers, gets knocked off the side of Sword Valley when Egil moves it to start attacking Bionis, and is shown hanging from another Defense Force soldier who's being carried by a Napon Terex. I'll give the Terex being able to carry two Homs, that seems perfectly reasonable, and I'll even give the Defense Force soldier being able to carry Vanguard, because, well, while they're portrayed as completely incompetent, they do still live through Vanguard's training routines, so they should at least have reasonable upper body strength. That being said, Vanguard was rushing in recklessly, so... I'm not sure how a Terex would even be able to get into position to save him in the first place. Yeah, they could probably fly faster than he could run, but I'm pretty sure they'd be more focused on supporting, like, other Napon or Hyentia or Atharon and Dixon's groups who were, like, actually sticking to the plan and doing what they were supposed to do over the crazy bloodthirsty guy who just kind of held forward, pressed buttons, and prayed. He'd also have been among the closest people to the Mechanis itself when all of this went down, and Mechanis and Galahad Fortress are pretty heavily equipped with artillery and would have face Mechon and stuff defending them, and those can fly as well, so he would be even more dangerous to even attempt to rescue. After that, he survives Egil just kind of haphazardly attacking the Bionis and intentionally trying to kill as many random small villages and take out people as possible. Remember, there was just kind of a cloud of flying things in between Bionis and Mechanis, roughly where the sword used to be while he was doing this, so Egil must have fly swattered at least a few out of the sky, and Vanguard, despite being in a very precarious situation, and remember we never really see him getting on a Havrez or something to escape easier, survives this too. He must have uncharacteristically mellowed out during the whole defensive Bionis thing, especially after Zanza awakes, because not only do we not see him defending Colony 6, but he also makes it into the new universe against all odds, continuing his tirade against his subordinates in the Defense Force. He is a very haha -ha funny character that a lot of people really like, but all of his memorable lines come before that first attack on Colony 9, and after that, at least twice, probably three times, he survived situations that Fiora needed a literal deus ex, or should I even say deus est machina, to come back from, in which she still literally died. So yeah, it's neither correct, accurate, nor responsible to say that Shulk has the most in Xenoblade 1. He is at least a character. Vanguard is just a catchphrase who is defended by the writing for no real reason, when it probably would have served the story even better had he died. Also, he's in Future Connected, but that doesn't really matter. Everyone who lived to the beginning of the new universe is around for Future Connected, so that's not a big deal. What would be a big deal, though, is if they kill Galgar after he seemingly dies once, but Vangar survives dying like three times. That would just be a real slap in the face. See you next April 1st for another very stupid video like this one. Uh, I hope you didn't take this seriously, because, yeah. Until next time, this is Luxon signing off. I'm sorry, Vanguard fans.